Our first speaker this morning will be in English. Hence, I will introduce him in English. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Walton is a university senior lecturer in the Faculty of Music and Fellow and Director of Studies in Music at Jesus College, Cambridge. His PhD is from the University of California, Berkeley, where he completed a dissertation on musical culture in Paris during the 1820s. He held the Kathleen Bourne Junior Research Fellowship at St. Anne's College, Oxford, from 2000 to 2002. He's also been on the lecture music at the University of Bristol. He joined the faculty at Cambridge in 2006. His monograph, Rossini in Restoration Paris, The Sound of Modern Life. We are about to talk about Rossini, even though it's a Wagner conference. Um, <laughs> was published by Cambridge University Press in 2007 and a collection of essays entitled The Invention of Beethoven and Rossini, co-edited with Nicholas Matthew, is forthcoming from the same publisher. Um, Dr. Walton's talk this morning will be titled The Invention of Goebbels Opera. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much. Um, to the conference organizers for inviting me to speak this morning. Um, I should say, just before beginning, that this paper, it does touch on Wagner briefly, but it is, in a way, it's about a, a prehistory um, to the Wagnerian world of opera. That said, no paper about 19th century opera can manage not to be about Wagner, so Wagner is there floating around anyway. But what I'm looking at this morning is about the, um, the early operatic tours in the 19th century beyond Europe, and the larger idea that they came to represent, um, even though the tours themselves, as you'll hear, were often on quite a different scale than the um, reporting of them suggested. So, on the 8th of May, 1821, Giacomo Rossini sent a letter to his father in Bologna with a question about a singer named Teresa Schironi. Tell me, he wrote, if she is soprano, contralto, beautiful, ugly, young, old, prima or seconda donna, in sum, a detailed description of her means. What provoked Rossini's request? Perhaps reports of La Pietra del Paragone and Tovato e Dolisca, or from Pisa, where the year before she'd sung the title role in L'Italiana in Al Algeria. Or perhaps Rossini was responding to a more distant recollection, originating from any one of the clutch of opera houses on the northern Italian circuit, at which Schironi had performed in seasons stretching back over the previous seven years. Ferrara, Torino, Piacenza, Monza, Pavia, Asti, or La Scala Milan where she had appeared in 1816 as one of the three ladies in the magic flute. On the envelope of the letter, the elder Rossini wrote two terse words in response, contralto modena, where Schironi had moved after Bologna for a performance of Rossini's Elisabetta. And if either Rossini ever discovered any more detailed information about her, it has not survived. Schironi carried on her career apparently unaffected by this momentary interest and by the carnival of 1823 was singing in another Rossini opera in another little Italian town, this time the role of Pippo in La Gazza Ladra in Reggio Emilia. There must have been plenty of other singers helping to stimulate insatiable hunger for Rossini. primary roles in secondary theatres. Names are all there in the printed libretti, and some still surface in specialised dictionaries, thanks to their involvement in a significant premiere, or because of an eventual success. But not Schironi. We have little more price information than Rossini about whether she was bella or brutta, or even exactly how old she was. We do know, however, that she never sang in any of the great European operatic centers, aside from La Scala Milan. Not in Rossini's Naples, for an example, 
from where he had sent his inquiry to his father in 1821, nor in the cities of Vienna, London, and Paris, to which Rossini would travel in the years to come, each gladly succumbing to Rossini fever. And all four of these cities also feature in the famous opening sentence of Stendhal's Vido Rossini from late 1823, marking out four of the six corners of the Rossinian Empire. Of the remaining two cities, Moscow was surely present to add weight to the Napoleonic comparison on which the entire statement depends. Since the death of Napoleon, there is another man talked about every day in Moscow as in Naples, in London as in Vienna. And then comes the final pair. In Paris as in Calcutta. But what is Calcutta doing here? Unlike the other places on the list, Calcutta had been untroubled by Napoleonic ambitions and had no operatic tradition to speak of. Why then include it in the imaginary world of Rossinian conversation? Two answers spring to mind, and both tend in the same direction. First, Stendhal's opening gambit marks a moment in the development of Rossini as celebrity when talk about the composer could proceed or even substitute for performances, thereby becoming another part of the ever-increasing flow of information from metropole to column, aided by a burgeoning newspaper culture. Rossini as talking point in London or Paris, represented and exported through the press, could become the talking point of Calcutta as easily as Paganini, Sontag, Taglioni, or any other celebrated contemporary. Demand for his music, meanwhile, could at least partially be satisfied by the sale of the youth plethora of collections and arrangements, such as the excerpts from the Barber of Seville and Tancredi for two flutes or for piano, printed in the Calcutta-based monthly musical miscellany in 1825. News and commerce intertwined perfectly to make composer and music part of a material culture that included journals, sheet music, and exported instruments, all shaped by the dynamics of the colonial economy. The second explanation for Calcutta's presence at the start of a book about Rossini derives from the projection of these local factors onto larger scales. For Stendhal, Calcutta functions as synecdoche for some version of the whole world beyond Europe. Imagined operatic communities become linked within, a, within an imagined world community, all parts of which are talking about Rossini. Indeed, potentially, they could even be doing so at exactly the same time, as suggested by a Stendhalian paraphrase that appeared in the London-based New Monthly magazine. Since the death of Napoleon, Rossini's name is the only one that is pronounced in the same evening at London, Naples, Paris, Madrid, Moscow, New York, Calcutta. Within such a cosmopolitan fantasy, the precise cities listed are clearly less important than their shared quest for the sort of aesthetic consensus about Rossini's music that would quickly become almost proverbial. It's no surprise, for instance, to find Wagner over 20 years later in Oper und Drama stating as a commonplace that the whole world celebrated Rossini for his melodies. Back in the 1820s, however, when such statements were still accompanied by their lists of cities in Stendhalian fashion, it's striking that Calcutta tends to remain constant, almost as if in premonition of the moment that, a decade later, in 1834, a motley Italian troupe would indeed arrive and perform a series of operas at Calcutta's Chaparingi Theatre the majority of them by Rossini. Although in truth, the group was not motley enough, consisting of three basses but no tenor, along with one contralto who specialized in trouser roles and another who acted as prima donna. She was called Teresa Schironi, by this time well on the way to a complete operatic circumnavigation of the globe. What new vistas of early 19th century life might we discover by combining the calculated overstatement that opens Stendhal's book and the happenstance voyaging of Schironi. Certainly such a joining together allows us to see beyond the more obvious binaries that they represent in juxtaposition, whether general and particular, macro and micro, or even fantasy and reality. 
and on closer inspection, they themselves turn out to be already thoroughly caught up together, caught within a global project that might best be described, use, described using the grand locutions of modernity, or less grandly as chattering about Rossini. As Stendhal obliquely implies, it was Napoleon who started all of this. The first complete performances of operas by Italian singers outside Europe took place in Rio de Janeiro, where the Portuguese royal family and, and entire court had decamped in 1808 in flight from Bonaparte's troops invading Lisbon. Once arrived, immigrant royals set about transforming their new hometown into a suitably grand location for the resituated capital of the Portuguese Empire. To this end, the king quickly had a theatre built that aimed to replicate the main Lisbon Opera House, the San Carlos, and imported both singers and composers to produce music for it. By 1819, Rossini's Tancredi had also been performed there just six years after its Venetian premiere. Schironi's own route from Reggio Emilia to Rio, where she arrived a few years later in 1827, is still mysterious in parts, though she probably came from Barcelona, where she had been performing in 1824, in 1825 had gone through an embarrassing divorce. It was this last event that drove her to leave both city and continent. In any case, things clear, were clearer for some of the other members of her eventual troupe. Giacomo Betali, for instance, one of the bases, had arrived in Rio in 1826 as part of a consignment of 25 singers, dancers, and other musicians who'd set sail from the French port of Le Havre, brought set up a shipping service between Margarita Caravaglia, meanwhile, the other same been signed up at the for the Théâtre Italien in Paris, Benjamin T. These are available thanks to reviews that both received for their debut performance in Rossini's Lingano Felice that were so stingingly bad, it's hard not to wince in sympathy almost 200 years on. That one hears Signora Caravaglia sing, one feels a completely new sensation, that it would be hard to analyze. The lack of more precise language leads one to say that one is listening to a voice, but this voice has nothing human in it. It is a voice apart, and it has intonations and inflections. If the real could find such an all, we will say for serio cantante that he may be a comedian. We are well disposed to believe, for we regard his engagement itself. That he is serious, one wouldn't dispute, after having seen him play Figaro. But that he might be a singer, that anyone who has heard him or who has tried to hear him will deny. But Monsieur Bataille, he can't become a good singer, but embrace another calling and retire from a career in which he can only find misery and displeasure. The reviewer blamed Matza who had proclaimed Caravaglia as famous in her native, as famous in her native. Caravaglia, or someone very close to her, then responded with a letter in her defense to the same. Betali then also wrote in to say that he was doing his best and that he'd been told in Milan he would be good enough to sing in Rio. A different paper printed from Texier, the Parisian ape, who complained that he'd been given the task of finding singers in Italy short notice and at carnival time, when anyone good engaged. Several things emerge from this recriminate, recriminatory Brazilian tale. First, the public sphere of Rio de Janeiro had real power. The operatic conversation of Stendhal mattered, in other words. And the same pattern would be repeated in reviews and often impassioned letters in the new press erupting in Buenos Aires, Montevideo, Santiago and Lima. Second, that the mechanics of getting singers to South America may sometimes have relied on personal initiative for the, for the original transcontinental journey, 
but more often depended on the sort of system already used in prestigious opera houses throughout Europe. And finally, that based on these reviews, the experience of hearing Schironi's troupe may not always have been an unalloyed pleasure. Schironi herself arrived a few months later via Recife further up the Brazilian coast, possibly in the company of another of her eventual troupe, Domenico Pizzoni. And they left with Caravaglia, Batali, and another tenor during 1828, heading down first towards Montevideo, the new capital of the shortly to be independent Uruguay, where they picked up a French violinist, Théophile Planel, but lost their tenor again. From there, the dates of the rest of the tour out in a straightforward fashion, if with some gaps, pieced together from customs records and shipping lists, and moving round the coast of South America from Montevideo to Buenos Aires. Here's the, this is Pizzoni and Caravaglia um, leaving Buenos Aires. And here are Schironi and Batali. Interestingly, both of them having to travel as if they're couples, though they weren't couples, but for respectability to be on the boat, they have to pretend to be couples. So they go to Buenos Aires, from there to Valparaiso and Santiago in Chile, and then to Lima in Peru, before heading across the Pacific to Macau in China, and finally to Calcutta via Singapore, where the troupe arrived in December 1833. These are the arrivals in Calcutta. Um, so you can see again that um, the, s the spellings change, that Batali and Pizzoni um, now traveling together, and then um, by another route, we have Stuart Valia and Mayorga, who'd joined them as a different member. So here are all the dates put together. Now, any search for the resonances generated by such a transglobal journey in each new location would clearly start from a close attention to local detail, while also intersecting with the larger themes in each place of nation building, the formation of Europeanizing elites, and the meanings of opera beyond the opera house. But for the purposes of my argument today, I'll skirt round large parts of these varied receptions, pausing only to note the virtual companionship of Stendhal at several stages of their journey. For instance, in the form of extracts from the Vida Rossini, translated into Spanish that appeared in newspapers in both Buenos Aires and Santiago. And there was also an English translation of Stendhal's book stocked at the East India Company Library in Macau. There's Macau in 1834, the year after they were there. And here's a picture of the East India Company building on the right where the library was. Macau was the summer residence for the non-Chinese merchants in Canton where the Schironi troupe performed a run of 11 complete operas between April and October 1833, before the autumnal change of wind facilitated their onward journey to Calcutta. Harriet Lowe, who had herself traveled all the way from Salem in Massachusetts to China to keep her aunt company while her uncle traded in Canton, was inspired by these performances to borrow the copy of Stendhal's book from the East, from the East India Company Library which then in turn shaped her own responses to the operas she heard, as recorded in the impressions in her diary. And much of what we can now reconstruct about these performances in Macau comes from Lowe's diaries, written for her sister back in Massachusetts, and only published many years later. Even here in Macau, however, there were two newspapers which also carried operatic news. And although the editor of one of them would bewail the fact that European residents in Macau felt cut off and secluded from the great family of mankind, in fact, the, tr the traffic of international trade still allowed for participation in the global opera circuit. In May 1834, for example, the London magazine Le Boudoir quoted a playbill of the Schironi Company's performance of Fernando Paez Agnese from Macau the previous summer. The following month, June 1834, another report from Macau appeared, this time on the other side of the world, in a Buenos Aires newspaper, the British Packet. Both cases indicate some of the ways in which journalism was helping to map and thereby give existence to the increased ambit of opera as it spread around the globe, in a way that statistics of the tiny number of performers actually involved signally fails to indicate. And as a result, Italian opera itself is transformed, 
receiving a new set of contexts and meanings as a global idea. Stendhal's original idea seemingly merging with a far-flung reality. But in the case of Skironi's troupe in Macau, this was only the start, since in 1836 their makeshift season of operas would be granted a more significant afterlife through its appearance in a book by John Francis Davis entitled The Chinese, a general description of China and its inhabitants. Davis was a renowned Sinologist, an author of a Chinese dictionary, and his account of the kingdom and culture of kingdom and its culture was a great success, going through multiple editions and translated into several European languages. And in the middle of his examination of Chinese literature, he diverts to tell the story of the Italian opera season of 1833, describing the tour as a singular instance of the opera performing a voyage around the world. This part of Davis's account was quickly picked up by various European journals, which were themselves copied by other journals, creating an echo chamber of press coverage uh, traceable over the following years. And here's a list of some of them. May 1837, Vienna, der österreichische Zuschauer. October 1837, Milan, Ricogliatore Italiano e Straniero. January 1838, Bologna, Teatri Arti e Letteratura. The same month in Leipzig, Die Zeitung für die Elegante Welt. March 1838, Paris, Revue des Salons. At the same time, also in Paris, a book of translations of Chinese plays appeared by Antoine Bazin the Elder, which again mentioned the Italian performances in Macau, citing Davis and setting off another chain of reviews, including an important one by Charles Magnin that was reprinted in his collected works during the 1840s, and which marked a shift towards cementing Skironi and her company in Macau in monumentalized form, whether in the Encyclopédie Catholique of 1844, where it appeared in volume seven as part of an entry on China, in a chapter on Chinese theater in J. L. Klein's Geschichte des Außereuropäischen Dramas, or in Cesare Cantu's monumental and much translated 30 plus volume Storia Universale, as part of a volume on world travels from the ancient Egyptians via Magellan to the present. In Cantu's version, the fact that by the 1830s even opera singers could no, now go round the world is adduced as evidence that in this modern age anyone can do so, for whatever reason. In many of the other versions, however, another sort of interpretation is involved, as Davis's account is glossed and re-glossed. In its original form, Davis had offered a direct juxtaposition of Italian and Chinese opera, noting that the Cantonese were surprised to find what in the jargon of Canton is called a sing-song, erected by the foreigners on the shores of their celestial empire, and in that very shape too, which most nearly resembles their own performances, a mixture of song and recitative. As his narrative goes on, though, Italian and Chinese operas begin to merge, with venues, actors, and dramatic style turning out to be comparable in a way that both familiarizes the one and defamiliarizes the other. Yet for all that, Davis had himself attended the Italian operas in Macau and knew that they had been laid on for an audience of foreign merchants and local residents of his descent. But for those paraphrasing Davis, this quickly became the moment when the Chinese heard opera for the first time. And not just any opera, but the operas of Rossini. It is not possible to describe the strong impression that the music of this great man made on the soul of the Chinese, in the words of the report in Teatri Arti e Letteratura, as part of a roundup of operatic performances that included reviews from Corfu, Cephalonia, Forli, Vienna, Ferrara, and Florence. Shalmania subsequently decided that it was indeed possible to describe the effect it had had on the Chinese soul, or rather to fabricate it, and announced that, to the honor of the Chinese, the music of the illustrious composer obtained as much success before this audience as among us. And the final step came in 1886, when a book on Chinese theater for a French audience by the bilingual Chinese general, Chen Ki Tong, 
returned once more to Davis and the Italian opera performances as proof of the Chinese love for all types of music, Rossini included. In Paris, as in Macau, in other words, though he went on to underline the one-way nature of the imaginary exchange. I would have loved to have found proof, Chen Tong, that the singers of Rossini themselves heard Chinese singers and expressed similar opinions, but there is no record of this. However compelling Stendhal's statement might unwittingly turn out to be as a delineation of the development of a 19th century global operatic consciousness that I've tried to sketch here, the real reason that he chose to invoke Calcutta at the opening of the Vida Rossini in truth had no direct connection with any such weighty issues. Instead, the characteristic style, Stendhal had chosen Calcutta because he copied it from someone else. That someone, not for the first time, was the Italian critic Giuseppe Carpani, who in an article in the Biblioteca Italiana, sure enough, lists Calcutta, Naples, London, and Vienna in his original list of Rossinian cities, while adding St. Petersburg, Cadiz, and Philadelphia. But where Stendhal celebrates conversation about Rossini, Carpani strikingly proposes instead a world musical soundscape, it is Rossinian melody in itself that, to quote him, in a short time makes the circuit of the earth, touches on every shore and enters every port. In simple and naked beauty like another Venus, Carpani writes, it glides along the surface of the ocean and subjects the land to its irresistible attractions. And as a result, and in place of Stendhal's simultaneous conversations, for Carpani it is the same melodies that are heard at one and the same moment in the streets of Calcutta and in those of Naples, London, and so on. This, then, Carpani's version, is the version picked up by Wagner sitting in Zurich in the early 1850s to write Oper und Drama. It is Rossini's melodies cheered throughout the world. And in Wagner's grander scheme, of course, Rossini's melodies that also cause the true history of opera to come to an end by giving the operatic public exactly what they wanted. But whether positively or negatively articulated, the question remains, does this change of emphasis from conversation about Rossini to Rossini's melodies complicate things productively, or is it a step too far? Clearly, Rossini did not literally introduce the naked beauty of melody to the cities of South America, nor to Macau or Calcutta, and nor to Wagner's Zurich. And in fact, it's the reception of opera in Calcutta that might help here. A few months before the arrival of the Schironi troupe in Calcutta, an article on colonial life in India by Emma Roberts appeared in the Asiatic Journal, which dwelled at length on the lack of conversation in comparison with Europe. New novels and poems, Roberts writes, fertile subjects for discussion at parties in England are mentioned coldly and carelessly, if at all. New arrivals fancy that they shall gain the general ear by vivid accounts of the new wonder that they've left in England, but are woefully disappointed. Persons who rave about Paganini, Zontag, or Taglioni are much in the same predicament here as the narrators of tiger hunts are in England. They are voted bores and soon discover that unless they are prepared to fall into the opinions and prejudices of their new associates, they will sink into nobodies. Once the Italian singers had begun their performances, however, some argued that all this had changed. The Italian opera, wrote one critic, counteracts the attacks of climate and ennui, and ensures a succession of halcyon days to the light-hearted and pleasure-loving portion of the dwellers in the metropolis of British India. And so who made up this audience? The writer goes on to explain. Nor has the mania been confined to Europeans. The natives likewise have been inoculated with a musical ardor. Orthodox Hindus and Muslims may be observed occupying an opera box and listening with doubtless unfeigned admiration to the beauties of Il Barbiere or Semiramide whilst one of the wealthiest and most intelligent of their body actually received lessons in singing from the basso cantante of the Italian company. 
This bears all the trappings of another fantastical encounter along the lines of the imaginary Rossini loving Chinese at Macau. But perhaps not. We know that audiences at the Chowringi Theatre were to some extent mixed in the way described. And in 1835, the year after Skironi and company arrived in Calcutta, the theatre had been bought by the prominent Bengali businessman Dwarkanath Tagore, grandfather of Rabindranath. Later in the century, the famous German philologist Max Miller would recall meetings with Dwarkanath Tagore in his apartment in Paris in 1845, just 20 years after the publication, also in Paris, of the Vida Rossini. And by way of conclusion, a single anecdote of Miller's is worth quoting at some length. What Tagore liked was to have me accompany him on the pianoforte, and I soon found that he had not only a good voice, but had been taught fairly well. So we got on very well together. After complimenting him on his taste for Italian music, I asked him one morning to give me a specimen of real Indian music. You would not appreciate it, he said. But as I asked him again and again, he sat down to the pianoforte, and after striking a few notes, began to play and sing. I confess I was somewhat taken aback. I could discern neither melody, nor rhythm, nor harmony in what he sang. But when I told him so, he shook his head and said, you are all alike. If anything seems strange to you and does not please you at once, when I first heard Italian music, it was no music to me at all. But I went on and on till I began to like it, or what you call understand it. It's the same with everything else. You say our religion is no religion, our poetry no poetry, our philosophy no philosophy. We try to understand and appreciate whatever Europe has produced, but do not imagine that therefore we despise what India has produced. If you studied our music as we do yours, you would find that there is melody, rhythm, and harmony in it quite as much as in yours. So in the figure of Tagore, a cosmopolitan Bengali, seated at his piano in Paris, and inspired by lessons in bel canto with one of the basses in Skironi's company, perhaps that very same ba bass who'd been brought from Milan and told by the reviewer in Rio that he should give up singing. The circumnavigation of Rossinian melody might seem complete. At the same time, however, it's revealed inevitably as only one of many possible journeys backwards and forwards in Europe and beyond. In the same way, then, that the completion of Skironi's journey for now remains unclear to me, after she reached Cape Town in late 1838, so any move to close the global circuit through Tagore turns out instead only to be an opening out, a multiplication of loose ends that would then increase in complexity as the century wore on. The full story of the invention of global opera, in other words, turns out to be as closely woven and inscrutable as any national or local history. And Stendhal and Carpani's fantasies of conversation and melody can both echo on, but now in interrogative form. What does it mean for our cherished stories about European opera when composers start to be talked about and their melodies sung in Montevideo, as in Macau, in Rio de Janeiro, as in Lima, in Buenos Aires, as in Calcutta. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, very interesting quote. It made him think of the sort of survival. Of course. Um, in a sense, does it in reverse. Whenever one talks about the first part of the festival, always mentioned that Don Pedro from Brazil traveled to Byron, uh, and that's supposed to, in a sense, I guess, uh, indicate the global impact of Wagner, but the world has to travel to Wagner. Although then there's the interesting moment for Wagner, of course, where he thinks that he might be writing this time for Rio. Ah. And the interesting thing about that, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting that it's even sort of put forward as a possibility. Then there's the moment that Wagner says, well, right, if I'm writing it for Rio, it will be an Italian opera. Um, but then also you get these glimpses when Wagner's talking about Rio of what he imagines Rio to be. Because there's some, he has some discussions with Semper, the, the architect, who, who is planning to design an opera house in Rio. And at one point Wagner says, um, well, what a strange thing it will be to design an opera house for a black audience. 
And you sort of think, okay, so imagining Brazil as entirely populated by descendants of African slaves, you know, that you sort of get this version of his Brazil, which is um, uh, uh, an honor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Questions for our speaker today. Sorry, there really wasn't much loud in there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's not a question, it's just uh, an observation. Uh, what I would like to suggest is that Italian opera, opera has uh, always been global in a certain sense from the beginning. Bec but before it had a uh, European dimension and uh, uh, probably the public, the audience belong only to the elite of the society. So which, which is in your opinion the difference between the 19th century and the previous time? Thank you. Yeah, I mean that's a really, that's a really important question but yeah, you're absolutely right. I didn't touch on it here. The history of opera outside Europe, um, and there's a there's an active operatic life in places like Lima, say, in the 18th century. There's also famous cases of um, a performance of Piccini being done at the court in China that supposedly is so successful that then the Chinese emperor trains up some Chinese musicians to only play this piece and builds a theatre just to play this one opera because he liked it so much. So, there's, uh, so I mean, yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting earlier history. What I'm trying to suggest here is that it's only after the... It's only from the early 19th century, so from the sort of the Napoleonic moment onwards, when the combination... First of all, you begin to get touring, it, touring Italian troops specifically going beyond Europe to take opera from one place to another. Whereas before, the typical thing would have been to use local musicians. So you'd bring the music, but you wouldn't always have the, 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 the performances. Sometimes you would have Italian musicians too, but they'd be brought out for, a, for that local elite audience. The difference, as I see it, is to do with the transmission of that knowledge then back to Europe and, as I suggested, also to places like Buenos Aires. In other words, it's the moment when the growth of newspapers means that this gets picked up as one of those little stories coming from around the world. And so you begin, in, in music journals like, like the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung, you begin to get what's happening in Rio. You know, you get reports from Rio. But also in general newspapers, you get these little bits about, oh, have you heard there's been opera in China? So that's the shift I'm suggesting. So it sort of becomes... I mean, the other thing to say, which you pointed out and is, is, is key, and I mean, it's sort of self-evident, but worth saying, given the way I've been throwing around the world word global here, this is not global. I mean, this is, this is a very specific um, set of cities based on trade routes, and frequently it's still only the elites who go and see the opera. So, you know, we're talking, we're talking about a fantasy, but it's still a fantasy that in the 18th century I don't think you would have seen broadcast in the same way. exportieren sollte. Beispiele. Es geht so viel verloren, wenn die dänische Sprache übersetzt wird. Was er nicht der bestimmte Humor hier und da. Die Personen sind plötzlich andere. Das Verloren sind bestimmte Rituale, die das Publikum einbringt in bestimmten Szenen. Da wird applaudiert, da wird mitgeklatscht in der Oper während des Kehraus. Und äh, das sind äh, Dinge, die 
bei der Nationaloper oder bei einem Nationalsingspiel, was gleichsam eine andere äh, niedere Gattung ist, wenn es so ist, dass bei äh, Kulaus Elberheu an dieser Stelle das Publikum nicht aufsteht. Äh, denn die Melodie, die ist da, äh, da fehlt etwas an der Atmosphäre, da wird mitgesungen äh, und das sind Dinge, die äh, einfach äh, national etwas so festhalten in dem Land, äh, den sie angeht. Und es ist dann eine wichtige Forderung, dass eine Nationaloper nicht aus dem Repertoire genommen wird. Dass es Jahr für Jahr äh, oder in kleinem äh, Abstand möglich sein muss, dass eine neue Generation mit dieser Oper, mit diesem Spiel aufwächst. Yes, I mean, this sort of comes back to the earlier point too, that yes, in a way, Italian opera, again from beforehand, has already been uncomplicatedly international, that there's never any question about Italian opera being national, well, there is in Italy later in the 19th century, but um, that, the, that the international element sort of goes unsaid. That said, the, the language element, when Italian opera reaches South America, there's a lot of discussion about why is it in Italian should it be in Spanish? And there's the famous case with Garcia's company in Mexico of them needing to translate the Italian opera into Spanish to make it sound national, even though it's coming from Italy. So there is some of the same tension there. The one other thing I'd like to say, which again is sort of self-evident to an audience of Wagnerians, but probably worth saying, is the way that what I'm sketching out here sits alongside um, were you to do a search of Wagner's writings for the word Welt. <laughs> um, the version that a writer like Wagner turns to in terms of the world, the world of opera, the world of um, listeners that he wants, whatever it is, which can be very national, of course, that that can be an extremely German world with its borders spreading out, or it can imply something vaguer, um, but it doesn't include what's going on here. Und was Sie gesagt haben, auch der Freischütz in Paris geschehen. Das gerade deswegen. Um, if Italian companies performing abroad um, were ready to make compromises in performing in front of new audiences. Did they adapt? Is there any evidence if Italian companies performed differently according to the places they had to face, like uh, Macau, Calcutta, like Rio de Janeiro? Yes, it's the short answer, and I, I suppose there's sort of two parts to it. One is very practical, which is that, as I, as I mentioned, they don't have a tenor, and they don't have a, a soprano, which is less of a problem for the Rossinian repertory they're doing, but certainly the lack of a tenor is a real problem. So they're already having to do multiple adaptations to cope with putting on these operas at all. But also, yes, in, in, in regards of the audience, they are responding quite strongly to um, what goes down well and what doesn't. And that doesn't, that, that it, it's noticeable that that is very different from city to city that in one city a particular opera in their repertory will be the one that they do over and over again and becomes the local favorite. And then it might be performed twice in the next place, but no one really likes it, so they move on to doing something else. The thing that's really hard for them, um, although they have this sort of set repertory of 15 or 18 operas, the thing that's really hard is that if you're dealing with a small audience like in Macau, or in fact most of these places, basically the same people coming in again and again, if they're not familiar with how operatic seasons work, they expect something new every single time they go. So there's interest and criticism in some of the local newspapers trying to educate the public about, it's okay, if you go to an opera house in Europe, you hear the same piece several times, and that's a good thing. That doesn't mean it's getting boring, so just stick with it. So there's, so there's a lot, so you get a lot from the newspapers in terms of trying to train the audiences to react in the way that um, the critic thinks that they ought to.
because, yeah, there's this enormous problem of do we really have to produce another new piece? We only just sang a new piece last week. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for this excellent talk. I was very much struck by the um, importance you attribute to the press within this whole um, construction of global opera. Do you know anything about the, the, the actual, how the theaters kind of wanted to have this done? I mean, is there something like a PR or something like that? Were they especially eager to get these articles and uh, being reported about the process that were, you know, That's a really good question. Again, it, it varies from place to place, but to take the example of Calcutta, um, the press in Calcutta is lively and more active than anywhere else they went. There are so many newspapers. Um, so in that specific case, yes, I think there is a sense that the, in Calcutta, you broadcast back to London, look what we've got here. But that also happens in, in Buenos Aires. This, there's, a, there's, a, there's a moment in a newspaper in Buenos Aires, a, the Spanish language newspaper, where they say, we've, had a, we've seen a copy of a London paper that reports that there has been opera in Buenos Aires. So in other words, what's happened is that there's been a review in Buenos Aires that's been taken on a packet boat all the way to London. It's been picked up in a London paper, come all the way back, and then a newspaper in Buenos Aires says, we exist here because it's been reported in London. So there is a of that. The one other thing I'd add about the Calcutta theatres, the really interesting thing about Calcutta in relation to the other places, is Calcutta, a lot of time the Calcutta newspapers pretend that Calcutta is a suburb of London. That is, in a Calcutta newspaper, you'll get a report from the Drury Lane Theatre, but nothing saying that heard that several months ago... we're all part of the same group, right? We're all in London. So in that sense, yeah, it becomes very important. We have Italian opera, you have Italian opera. So, yeah, that's really different from the situation in Spanish, South America, where there's some insight that isn't from Spain as an independent nation. Thank you very much.